Now that you have cleaned, conditioned and filled the burette, it is time for titration. The burette is firmly clamped into the burette clamp at the bench. As you may recall that the burette was filled past the zero calibration mark. Some of the titrant in the burette must now be drained so that the meniscus of the titrant is within the volume readings of the burette. I'm going to place a white piece of paper at eye level behind the burette. This makes the meniscus level of the fluid easy to detect and read. Open the stop cork and drain a small amount of titrant into the waste beaker which is placed below the tip of the burette and get the meniscus level of the titrant just below zero calibration mark. The meniscus level does not have to stop at zero and in fact it is a waste of time trying to get it to stop there. Observe the lower level of the meniscus relative to the volume markings of the burette and record this value up to two decimal places in your lab manual. In our case the value is 0 0.10 milliliters. This is the initial volume. Now the analyte can be added to our experimental setup. The waste beaker is removed from below the tip of the burette and placed on the side. Our analyte is in this Erenmeyer flask which I'm placing below the tip of the burette. It is important to note that the tip of the burette is below the top of the flask to ensure that the titrant from the burette is completely collected and contained inside the flask. Also keep in mind that we will be mixing our analyte with the titrant using a swirling motion of the flask. Hence the tip of the burette should not be so further down that it hinders the swirling motion. Our analyte already contains the indicator. For an acid-based titration we use phenolphthalein indicator. The indicator is colorless in an acid solution. When enough titrant from the burette has been added to the analyte, the contents of the flask will turn to pink. We are now ready to begin our titration. Open the stop cork and allow the titrant to add to the flask. For an efficient titration, the titrant is added fairly quickly at the start and is slowed down to dropwise near the end point. You may notice that the faint pink color appears in the flask which then disappears upon agitation. The end point reaches just when the faint pink color is retained by the solution for about 15 to 20 seconds. Just when you notice that the pink color persists and does not change or disappear upon agitation it is time to close the stop cork. Now that we are approaching our end point we are going to start a single drop addition of the titrant into the flask. Now barely open the stop cock enough so that a drop of the titrant is added to the flask. Just when you notice that the faint pink color takes more than a fraction of a second to disappear, close the stop cork again. Barely crack open the stop cork just so a drop of the titrant forms on the tip of the purette. Use deionized water to rinse off this drop from the tip of the burette into the flask. After swirling the flask, if the pink color persists for about 15 to 20 seconds, you know that the end point of the titration has been reached. I'm now going to place a white piece of paper behind the liquid level of the burette. Observe the lower meniscus level of the titrant relative to the volume markings of the burette and record the volume up to two decimal places inside your lab manual. In this case our volume is 10.50 milliliters. This is the final volume. The equivalence volume is the difference between the initial volume and the final volume. A good titration technique requires practice. Enough experience is required to know when to stop the fast addition of the titrant and switch to slower addition, which is dropwise addition. In the case when you have fast addition of the titrant, you might overshoot the endpoint, which would then look something like this, which is containing an excess amount of the titrant. Now you know a proper way to do titrations. It is now time to clean up.